hello and welcome to another episode of Flying High with Flutter. And I am your host, Alan Wyma. Today we have on a very special guest who basically we have a yearly tradition every Thanksgiving. This one's a little bit late where we do just kind of a catch up. Welcome, Matt. How are you? Hey, Alan. Good to be here one day after Thanksgiving. So we're pretty close to our, uh, our annual Thanksgiving special. I figure with our different time zones, this is probably close enough. So uh, we'll call this the Thanksgiving special. There's not really a set agenda today. I know that most Flying High with Flutter episodes are one company or one product. I do all things Flutter, and this is probably, what, my fifth time on the show, something like that. I believe I am officially the most frequent guest. So we'll talk about anything you want to. We can talk about what's new in my life, and we can also, of course, take audience questions. So I hope people do pop in and, uh, and ask anything that's on their mind. Yeah, this is true. For me, it's Saturday morning, so that's two days after, but uh, close enough. I think maybe everybody's getting out of their coma right now, right, on the Western side. That's right. I ate plenty on Thanksgiving, but it wasn't as bad as usual, which is probably the only reason I can sit here and speak is because I had like, I didn't go full, like, gross pig. I only went like halfway gross pig. So I'm mostly digested at this point. Last year, I was sitting here all alone. And this year I had my girlfriend come and, and cook with me. So the two of us spent Thanksgiving together. We made some turkey and green beans and Brussels sprouts and loaded mashed potatoes. And of course, a pumpkin pie, which for me is a must have on Thanksgiving. And so I was happy we made that and we had a great time. Yeah, for me, actually, this is the first year we didn't go all out and make a bunch of stuff. We only made a turkey. And it's interesting because the turkey is from Poland. It wasn't American turkey. <laughs> So we got this frozen, already cooked turkey we just stuck in the oven for about an hour. And no pumpkin pie this year, which I did ask for, but uh, it's too busy this year. This is kind of why things got a little bit late this year for Thanksgiving for us, right? Because I was crazy busy with other things going on. You, you got a whole turkey in the oven for only an hour? Yeah, it was pre-cooked. Oh, pre-cooked. Okay, okay. So we I, let, I, it dry, uh, let it thaw out overnight and um, been stuck in the oven for about an hour. And sadly, we don't have a gas oven, which is what I kind of miss. We just have these like electric ones, you stick it in the wall, you know? I do have a gas oven in range. Of course, you never know how much of that gas is leaking out at all other times of the day. It could be slowly killing me. So it's a bit of a trade-off. It's like a little faster cooking, but also like brain diseases or cancers or whatever the gas is causing. Or just a slow, peaceful death. Isn't that what uh, carbon monoxide basically would be if it's leaking out or am I wrong? I think that's, yeah, that's at least part of the gas that could be leaking out. But I, I have all of my Nest smoke detectors, which also are carbon monoxide detectors. So they'd be very loud if I was getting a lot of carbon monoxide in the house. Oh, just a little bit makes life a little bit better now. Or maybe just gives you headaches and makes you frustrated all the time. Well, I don't know. That sounds like a normal day for me at this point. <laughs> yeah, I can't tell the difference. Like it could be a gas leak or it could just be regular development responsibilities. One of those two is happening. But coming back onto topic, uh, things have been quite interesting. Uh, I mean, I think you already know what I'm trying to lead into over here, because I'm kind of curious what's on your mind involving the sudden departure of so many people in such a short amount of time. With your knowledge and, and your experience of being there, I'm guessing you probably read Hixie's blog post, right? Yeah, he had two. One was about his departure, and then I think there was some concern about him departing, and so he made sure to come back and quickly write a follow-up specifically about Flutter. And so you said a number of people. So that includes Eric Seidel was the first to go, then Tim Sneath, and now Ian Hickson. I, I apologize if I keep getting his last name wrong. He goes by Hixie everywhere, but I thought his actual last name was Hickson. So I, so Ian, sorry if I got your last name wrong, whether it's Ian Hixie or Ian Hickson. Um, he goes by Hixie on GitHub and other places. So Eric Seidel, I forget each of the official names of their roles, except for Ian's, but Eric Seidel was essentially the head of Flutter, and Tim Sneath had oversight across both Flutter and Dart, largely from kind of a PR and DevRel perspective. I don't think he was technically DevRel. Maybe he was, and I'm misremembering. But, you know, Tim was the one who always went out on stage to talk about, here's the latest release, here are the big features, here's what we're doing, here's why. So he was kind of the face and the voice of the combination of Flutter and Dart. And then Ian has been the tech lead, the TL for Flutter, for most of Flutter's history. 
Now, we were doing an X space or a Twitter space the other day, and we talked a little bit about what it meant for Ian to be the tech lead. That job didn't involve a whole lot of programming, but he set, he kind of enshrined the principles and the policies that supposedly governed the way that all the other Flutter team developers would contribute. So the idea of what constitutes an appropriate issue ticket, what constitutes an appropriate PR, uh, how do you think about problems that you're solving, to what extent are there quality expectations for the contributions of team members, what's the testing policy, a lot of that was conceived of and written down and enforced by Ian. That's essentially what a tech lead does on most projects. That's what he did. I imagine somebody will be coming in to fill that slot after him, though I have no idea who that is at this point, and I don't know what that person's principles might lead to. So I don't have any insider knowledge. I wasn't aware that he was going to leave before he left. I've been removed from the team for a few years now. I don't have a lot of insights into the current way things work. Most of my experience is back from 2018 to 2020 when I was a member of the team as a senior software engineer. Yeah, thanks for kind of putting some more input on that from your side. What I'm more interested in is obviously he named quite a lot of people, which I thought was a little bit ballsy, but you know, I can understand there's some probably some frustration there. But do you also kind of have the same thoughts as that things started changing, maybe for the worse, where the the objective of Google, or at least what you were involved in, was changing from making lives better to, you know, the bottom line or investors or this kind of thought process? So you mentioned that Ian named someone, and I forget the particular name. I think it was Janine something or other, but he said that she was the department head. Now, when I was on the team and I got myself into a bunch of trouble because I made the mistake of putting out free educational videos on YouTube without asking the right person's permission, I eventually had a sit down with some staff members. And I bring that up because one of the staff members that I had to sit down with was the head of the department. And that was a guy at the time, so a different person. And to the best of my knowledge, what we're actually finding out is that Flutter moved from one organization to another within Google. That originally Flutter was under the same department that included Fuchsia, the operating system. And I think sometime in the last three years, maybe shortly after I left, Flutter was moved to a different organization within Google. And I believe Ian outlined in his post the different areas that were under that organization. He included, obviously, Flutter and Dart, but I want to say maybe Firebase was in there, and he named a few other things. And I think that's the department that this person in question leads. So I actually wasn't there for the direction that that particular department head may have imposed. It sounds like they moved organizations, got a different mandate, and according to Ian, at least, that mandate was chaotic, the mandate was short-sighted, and that the team, or at least maybe the higher level people on the team felt that they were being pressured or forced to work towards near term kind of corporate goals over the long term health and prosperity of the project. But I think it's also worth flipping this around. Let's so I have some insights into the organization. And so that biases me a little bit. You're someone who doesn't have a history inside the organization, but you've been involved with flutter for many years. Now you've seen ups and downs. Did you see a marked downward slope in the last couple of years? Or does it feel like it's on an upward trajectory? Or does it feel the average to you compared to the last, you know, take the last two years and the last five years, did the last two years feel average to you compared to the last five or do they feel different? Well, I don't know if I've been around for five years, but I would say that things seem to be more mainstream. Like you, you feel that things are more calm. Like, cause for a while people have heard about Flutter not really looked at it and used it, but because of all the advances made, people started looking at it. Now it's become definitely more of a first round choice rather than just, a, oh, there's this thing I heard about. Let me look into it. Does that make sense? It's like more of a stable choice rather than one that could be risky because it's brand new. Well, if that's the case, if you feel that it's become more mainstream and more stable, wouldn't that typically be seen as a positive change over the last few years? I mean, it is positive in that case, but at the same time, when things become more mainstream, in my opinion, innovation starts to go down. 
that's kind of what I see to a certain extent, because you do have more customers to handle, adding in new features that are really pushing things into another direction. Do start to, you know, like slow down because you may be hurting people. Like look at Windows, right? They're very slow to change things for the reason that they're going to like hurt a lot of their customers, right? All this old business software written as opposed to Apple where they're like, okay, we're moving 32 bit support. And like it pissed a lot of people off, but maybe that moved us forward to a, a new direction, right? I mean, that was kind well, of one of the things I liked about Rails. Sorry, let's just put one more thing out there. Is that DHH, I mean, he's a very polarizing person, but for Rails, I agree that we need to actually start cutting things out in order to move forward. And I think that's something that I do like about Rails, but I can also see that, hey, you know, uh, not everybody has the resources to keep rewriting their software all the time to fit what the next version needs, right? Yep. It's funny that you mentioned uh, Windows or Microsoft as a counterexample, because I just earlier today, I was watching a video where I think one of the longtime higher technical people from Microsoft was talking about when they forked the OS between server and consumer. And they did that specifically because they felt that consumers would tolerate more bugs and they wanted to sell faster. So they cut their timeline in half. They shipped a, a hugely buggy system uh, because they didn't care that consumers were going to get a buggy product. And then the, the story went on from there. But so I would say actually Microsoft in that case was kind of the opposite. They didn't care what their interest in speed did to their consumer-based customers. I think you have to arrive at speed as a symptom or a result from principled analysis. That can't be the starting spot. You can't say, are we going to go fast or are we going to go slow? The question is, are you going to move responsibly or are you going to move irresponsibly? Whether you move responsibly or irresponsibly, you can end up moving fast or slow. Doing the responsible things, for example, effective testing in your apps, your packages, whatever, that might feel a little slow, but a month or two down the line, you're going to be going much faster because you're not creating uh, you know, quicksand for yourself. The same thing with being irresponsible. At first, you can go fast, and then pretty soon you can't move at all because you've made such an impossible mess that you have to just destroy everything and start over. So I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that Flutter going mainstream or becoming somewhat stable means that it somehow can't innovate. It just means that there's a certain level of responsibility they now need to practice. I think Ian, in a lot of ways, was a shepherd of that responsibility even before there was this sense of kind of stability among the release or mainstreamness. What concerns me a lot more, which has been true for years, is that the Flutter organization has this incredibly milk toast approach towards marketing. They won't take jabs at competitors. They won't put themselves up against competitors. They pretend there aren't any. They don't really want to be self-critical. It's just kind of this happy-go-lucky attitude all the time. And that was passable in 2017, 18, 19 when Flutter was really the only thing like it on the market. But since then, we've gotten Swift UI and Jetpack Compose and .NET MAUI and Kotlin Multiplatform, and all of those things are moving in their various directions, eating up market share, eating up attention. And if Flutter just keeps sitting here like that dog in the burning bar or burning restaurant or whatever it is saying everything's fine, we're going to wake up one day and Flutter's going to be relegated to the sideline, in my opinion because Flutter wasn't willing to stand up for its own capabilities and its own future, that worries me more than a sense of kind of slow technical progress. Does that make sense? I see what you mean, and um, it definitely makes sense. Maybe my concern is not even really much a concern, because, yeah, I mean, when I am doing client projects, I do want something that's stable. I mean, like you said, the, the benefit of it becoming mainstream is that longer, no longer do I have to make a case for using Flutter. It's like, oh, Flutter, okay, I know that. Like, the fact that people who aren't technical know about it, know that it's good, is good for me because I don't need to make a case for it anymore. I could just say, this is what I'm going to use and say, oh, that's great. We want to actually have all those different platform supports. So it's even better because they actually know that other part about it. I also see what you mean about like other people kind of copying. I think, was it Hixie who also said that there was actually porting? I don't know. I just read something recently. I don't remember who wrote it, but somebody was saying that they actually ported 
Flutter's rendering engine to Jetpack Compose, like literally like line by line or something like that. They were converting stuff from Dart to Java or whatever, make everything work. Have you heard about this? No, I don't know the specifics of that. Whatever article or comments you're referring to, I haven't seen them. There is a really weird situation within Google because historically Flutter was based on Skia. Skia is a rendering system. It didn't belong to Flutter. It wasn't built by the Flutter team. That's a separate Google team and a separate Google tool. And Skia has been used in the Chrome browser and the Android operating system. And Flutter decided to include a portion of Skia inside of every Flutter app. Now, more recently, that's not the case anymore. Flutter has actually started inventing their own rendering system called Impeller. But the reason I say it's complicated is because imagine that Jetpack Compose decided to bring Flutter-like Skia integration. Now, again, Android already had Skia, but if we're saying that Jetpack Compose, which is, of course, a team uh, within Google, if they're looking at the way Dart uses Skia and then they're creating Kotlin that uses Skia in a similar way, we can't really be mad at them for that because they're still another Google team. They have as much right to Skia as does Flutter, right? So I guess I'd need to know the specifics as to what's happening there. But I will say, I do remember some talk, even back when I was on the team, Jetpack Compose was already in the works. I do believe their team, they were pulling a lot of ideas from Flutter. Let's put it that way. They were not ashamed to use Flutter as a guide for what to do with Jetpack Compose, despite the fact that they're the same company in theory working towards similar goals. That, I mean, that should give you a little idea about the politics in that company. <clears throat> there are so many teams, so many projects, so many products, so many competing internal interests that you can get uh, counterproductive behavior where one team harms another one. And it wouldn't surprise me if various aspects of Android work against Flutter. Yeah, I always found that quite interesting that Google has all these different products into their same and they seem to be competing at some points, right? But I don't really consider Android and Flutter to necessarily be the two competing things because they have different overall goals. I mean, obviously, you're not going to be running your Android app on your native Android app on iOS, right? So obviously, Flutter is different for that case. If you want to have something totally native Android using all the native stuff, obviously, you go straight native and you probably want to look at Jetpack Compose, right? Well, I don't ever really support using the traditional SDKs. I, I think it's time for the world to move beyond that. But to your original point about Android being different from Flutter, that's definitely true. Android is an operating system. Flutter is a UI toolkit. The complication is that the Android operating system is very closely tied to the Android application development kit, or the, the Android SDK. And the Android SDK includes its own UI toolkit. So in effect, the Android team is shipping their own UI toolkit. So is the Flutter team. And that's where you find the conflict. But Android is technically an operating system, not a particular UI implementation. So if you're actually building an Android app using Flutter, then you're just not including the UI part in there, right? Is it actually part of the platform or is that something that just gets compiled in and turned on? I'm kind of curious about that. Uh, there's definitely a lot of it that's part of the platform, maybe all of it. I'm not sure where that line is. I mean, I guess you could probably open your Gradle file. I haven't created a, a traditional Android app in many years now. The last time I did that, it was before Kotlin was completely ubiquitous, and it was certainly before Jetpack Compose. But I would guess that pretty much everything in your Gradle file is stuff that you're pulling in. And so things that aren't in your Gradle file must be coming from the operating system. But another part of why this is so difficult to deal with is because there's not really a distinction between in Android what are called activities and fragments, or let's just say activities. There's activities, and then in an activity, you can display a UI which has what is called a view hierarchy. It's like a widget hierarchy, except they're, view, they're called views and they're mutable instead of immutable. Well, the activity is a core Android operating system component. That is part of the operating system. Every application has a manifest file which actually lists out all the different activities in the app and the operating system reads that manifest and it's the operating system's job to actually communicate with those activities. 
So activities are very much a part of that operating system. But activities also include an indirect reference to the view hierarchy, which means you can't really have one without the other. This is the spaghetti of all this Android stuff. It's reason number 1000 that I left Android behind to go work on and work with Flutter. It's just such a spaghetti monster dealing with Android code. And frankly, I think that's very similar in iOS. The sad irony here is that the more that the Android team and the iOS team spaghettify the operating system and the UI toolkit, the more they prevent people from leaving their own little walled garden. Because if the UI toolkit is completely entangled with the operating system, well, you have to use the operating system. You can't avoid iOS and avoid Android. Those are the operating systems of all of our pocket size rectangles. So you have to work with the operating system, and yet the operating system completely entangles this entire UI toolkit, one written in Java Kotlin, one written in Objective-C Swift, and so it becomes a real pain to try to escape it. In fact, a lot of the code in the Flutter engine is iOS code and Android code that tries to connect to all of the little lower level signals that bypasses the, the normal UI, like connecting to all the raw touch events, connecting directly to the input method editor to get keyboard software and har hardware keyboard input. All of that is about bypassing any kind of standard view hierarchy. And it's, uh, you know, it's not the easiest code to read or to understand or to work with because at the end of the day, Android doesn't really want you doing that, and neither does iOS. Like They have to make it possible, but they don't make it particularly easy. That's a lot of effort to do all this stuff. And it's interesting that, especially iOS, right, the main gatekeeper is allowing things like Flutter into that community, but I guess more apps overall is good for them. Not to mention it's hard to block out Flutter or React Native. I mean, React Native, I mean, that's using native components uh, overall, right? But the... Uh, for Flutter, right? It's got its own rendering engine, but if you block that, then you wouldn't really have games because obviously they're not using the native toolkit to show all those different elements, right? It would be very difficult. Of course, Google would never prevent Flutter from getting into the Play Store because they own Flutter. But even on the Apple side, if they really cared enough, maybe one day they could figure something out. But it would be really difficult for Apple to come up with any technical basis that would allow them to block Flutter without blocking other things. I think it would be questionable whether that move constitutes antitrust behavior. Now, I'm not really big on the government going after monopolies and things like that. I, I think that's almost always uh, counterproductive. But nonetheless, those laws do exist and people do sue people. So if the App Store really managed to come up with a policy that exclusively blocks Flutter, I think they might have a lawsuit on their hands. Yeah, they have to block anything else that's doing something similar i'm not sure if anybody else doing anything similar there must be something but we do have a question that came in which i think you'd be interested in somebody would like to know how is the uh bounty hunters project going yeah so let me start with what the flutter bounty hunters is that is why i'm dressed like this i'm the chief of the flutter bounty hunters and we're a team of flutter and Dart developers who work exclusively on Flutter and Dart open source packages. We look for infrastructure and tooling that many different companies need, but things that, that aren't related to the direct business concern. And so I, I always like to explain this with our most popular package, which is Super Editor. Super Editor is a document editing toolkit for Flutter developers. You can put together any kind of rich text editor you want. We have clients like Superlist, which have a productivity app. We also have supporters, clients like Clearful and Reflection, which publish journaling apps. We also have a client, Bringing Fire, which produces a tabletop gaming app. All of these different apps in different business verticals, they all need rich text editing. Rich text editing is a big thing to try to implement. It's kind of a never-ending set of features. Either all of those companies could go off and build it themselves, in which case 
it would be incredibly expensive, it would take a very long time, and it would distract from their regular business. Or they can outsource it to the Flutter Bounty Hunters. They pay us an hourly rate like a standard agency. We produce whatever features they need for their apps, and then we release it open source so the rest of the community can utilize those capabilities as well. So again, Super Editor is a real package where we have done this, where we have multiple funding clients. We have a growing portfolio of open source packages where we do this. And I would say that we've been in kind of a steady state for the last year and a half, maybe. We have a number of clients that fund things here or there. I really would like to get a lot more funding clients in because there are lots of people that would like to work for the Flutter Bounty Hunters but we don't have enough funding to kind of spread that work around. So one of the big challenges is to try and tell the world about the Flutter Bounty Hunters and show companies why it's in their interest to actually pay for open source work. Now, again, one of the big benefits here is that when two or three or five companies need the same kind of thing, you can take the same cost and you can divide it by two or three or four or five you might end up paying only 20% of what you would have paid if you built that capability internally. So there's a possibility for a lot of cost savings here, but it's kind of a network effect. The more funders we get, the more money the funders can save. And so I'm on this perpetual mission to find more companies and show them they can save a lot of money and help the community and hire better developers if they become a Flutter Bounty Hunters client. So again, we still build things. We still have funding clients. We're still moving along, but I would really love to get more companies into that funding model and work on a lot more packages for the community. I just want to share his follow-up comment with you. I figured you might like this one. Yeehaw. <laughs> <laughs> I need like a rope or something to say that. Yeah, you should start investing in some more uh, cowboy gear. I think the wall right behind you, you can definitely put a steer's head on there. Well, maybe if we get a few more companies funding our projects, I'll take a little bit of that and, uh, and buy some kind of dead animal for the wall. There we go. Or you could have taken the turkey, right? Yeah, well, we only got a turkey breast. So we only had like a third or something of a whole turkey. I heard that there's like a growing amount of people in the U.S. that they kind of factored out the price and also the waste from Thanksgiving. And they're like, all right, we basically only want white meat and breast meat. So I'm just going to buy turkey breast as opposed to getting a whole bird and like trying to figure out where to put the turkey leg and whatever else left. Well, I'm actually the exact opposite. I love dark meat. So in general, I try to go for the thighs. But thing is, a whole turkey, the cook time is like 20 minutes per pound. So you multiply that by like a 25 pound turkey, you're, all, you're there all day. So there's like a time cost to getting that much turkey. Yeah, I think mine was only like a 10 pound bird or something like that. I have to ask again. My wife went up and bought this one. So, but I know it's pretty small. It wasn't definitely wasn't 20 pounds. I know they said the next day they're going to have an American turkey coming and we could buy. But again, that was like you said, 20 pounds as opposed to what we have right now. We still didn't finish it all yet. So we've been slowly eating it away, you know, turkey sandwiches every yeah, day until sure. it's gone. Yeah, I've got uh, more of the turkey breast in the fridge and that'll be my meals for the next few days. Uh, so the same guys before he's, he's recommended you put up some wanted posters. Actually, I kind of like that idea. If there's somebody who's maybe, who's that Janine or whatever, maybe somebody would make a poster of her, but you know, I don't, well, I don't that's, recommend uh, posting somebody like that, but this came to my mind. I was never there under her. So I think maybe Ian needs to have, someone needs to send Ian that wanted poster and he can put it on his wall. You know, something that always came to my mind, I never thought to ask about it. The name's super declarative. I'm just curious about where the name came from. I mean, it's pretty simple. Flutter is all about declarative UI. And I was like, what would be like a declarative superhero? What would that be? And I came up with, well, there's Superman, so I'll be super declarative. And then for a mascot, I mean, I thought like every time I think about declarative in my mind, I just see an exclamation point there. And so I was like, I'll make the logo a superhero exclamation point to go along with the name super declarative. And that was about it. That's, that's about the depth of what led up to that name. And then it's been around ever since. Did it take you a while to come up with that name or no? Because usually that's always one of the hard parts is naming something. I don't think it took a long time. I was just sitting around. I was at that time, I, I was still working at Google, but I'd already decided that I was leaving. And so I was brainstorming various branding ideas. 
And I'm sure I had a bunch of other ones that I decided not to go with, but that was one of the things on the list that I eventually ended up going with after I finally left Google. How do you feel about leaving Google? Do you ever miss it? Or because people always on the outside say, oh, it's so great, but I've worked in big companies before and it sounds great on the outside. But once you get there, it's like, yeah, there's definitely some toxic people, toxic situations that definitely change your mindset. And yeah, you do want to actually end up leaving, right? Do I miss it? No, not really. I mean, I miss the money. The money was great. I also would say that if you are going to work for some kind of traditional company, th yes, the big tech companies are going to be about as comfortable as you can possibly get. So if that's the world that you want, by all means, go work for big tech. But I've enjoyed my work a lot more since leaving, where I've worked for a number of different clients on different kinds of projects, and I've been able to create all these packages and do this open source work. I mean, when I left Google, I hadn't even really investigated how a text editing controller works for a text field in Flutter. And now I've been the tech lead for really the only general purpose document editing toolkit for all of Flutter. So those are opportunities that I just was never going to get internally. And I mentioned earlier, as an aside, that I had been under investigation for the free YouTube videos that I published back in like late 2017, early 2018, because I didn't get the right bureaucrats permission to do it. They put me under investigation for six months. So for six months, I came in to work and I didn't know if it was going to be my last day. You know, there were lawyers that got involved. They all made it. They try to make it very scary. They had these meetings where they call you into this little room with lawyers and HR and stuff. And at the end of it, I'm like, a six month investigation, leaving me with an uncertain future for six months, all because I educated hundreds of thousands of people how to do great things with Flutter and I didn't charge the company a dime. I said, well, if that's the level of appreciation that this company has for me, I think I'll see my way out. That's what I eventually did. So I don't regret leaving. On a typical day, I enjoy my current life more. The only difference, of course, is that it's very difficult to earn the level of income that I was making there. I was working less there and making way more than I am now. Now I'm working more and I'm making less, but you know, everything has a cost. Yeah, I definitely say that I agree. And I had a similar situation as you. Some paper decided to interview me about one of the apps I made. I already declared to the bank, hey, I have my own limited company. Here's what it is. It's still operating. It's still working blah, blah, blah. Like all the paperwork stuff was already there. I didn't know I had to, cause I mean, they don't, they never tell you that stuff. They never say, oh, you have to get legal approval for this or, or you know what I mean? You cannot talk to media. You cannot do this. Like I didn't even think about this stuff. This, so I got interviewed. I gave my comments about the app and then all of a sudden, like it was huge gossip in the office. Oh, he talked to the paper. He was in the paper. Did you see the video? Did you see this? It's like, okay. And then that started the same situation. So it's so much of what you just said echoed with me. It's like, oh, this, this, this. But actually, I don't think they even said anything about where I was working. But obviously, if you look at my LinkedIn, you would see where I was. And then I guess in their mindset that whatever I did could possibly reflect badly on them. I think what they said in the end was something like, oh, because you worked on this app, which, by the way, was a long time ago, it wasn't even at that time. They said people would think that we don't pay you enough money, so therefore you have to moonlight to make ends meet. That was what their response was. But I can see your situation is much different. It's like you weren't even expecting any money. You just want to give some feedback. I don't know what is the, the reason for that one. I guess they're thinking that maybe you had some insider information well, or what? Did they give you any information about that? So you said your company didn't give you any information. What I will admit about mine is that probably at some point, something did cross my desk that I agreed to that in some subsection of a subsection of a subsection said that I wouldn't communicate in so-and-so way. The problem is that the kinds of agreements that you sign on to when you join one of these big tech companies, it's like one of those Apple end user license agreements. Do you even have time to read it? If you do read it, do you comprehend what's in there? If you do comprehend what's in there, are you going to remember it a year or two or three years from now? And it was complicated in my situation because I joined Nest when Nest was still its own company. It was, I mean, it was bought by Google, but it was still its own company. And then Nest became part of Google. And then Nest was spun out from Google under Alphabet. 
so like we had our own campus, we used our own software, we had our own identity. And the truth is on most days, I didn't really feel like or think of myself as a Google employee. I felt like a Nest employee. It just didn't really occur to me because when I first started doing the videos, I was actually, I was still at Nest. I hadn't joined the Flutter team yet. So when I was at Nest, it just, it felt weird to me like there would be any concern in terms of my position with Google because I didn't even really feel like a Google employee. I was in this different campus in a different city, you know, if 20 minutes away from Google HQ, working with different systems on different problems. You know, who cares that technically in some way I have a relationship with Google? But of course, the answer is they cared. And the answer is that probably I agreed to something that had some language in it that technically I was in violation of. And you asked, like, why did they investigate me? Why did they make it an issue? It's because they could. It's because technically there was some letter of the law that I violated and they found out. So they were going to investigate it and they were going to, you know, put it down on my permanent record or whatever. And that's their right. And it was also my right a few months later to say, see you later. I'm not going to spend my life trying to build things for you anymore if that's how you're going to treat me. That wasn't the only issue I had when working in the Flutter organization, but that definitely broke the camel's back. That was enough disrespect. And I decided that I might take issue with corporate lawyers in Google, but I love Flutter. So I will leave the corporate stuff behind and I will continue to help build Flutter from the community side. I find that so interesting about Flutter. It's like so many people, they leave the Flutter maybe team, they leave Google itself, but they still are drawn to Flutter and still care so much about it. Like Tim Smith is still tweeting about what's going on and he gave his input about this whole situation happening recently. The only person I think who's not saying anything is Chris Sells. I haven't seen him say something, but it seems like everybody else that I can think of still either is involved or still cares a lot and will comment and give their input. Chris Sells did have some commentary about it. Tim, I'm much more mixed on. I have my concerns about what Tim is doing at this point. But Eric went and started a company to literally continue building enterprise tools for Flutter. Ian says he's going to keep contributing from the outside. What Chris said that I guess didn't, it didn't make it into your timeline, but I saw Chris say that he also left due to leadership concerns and that his hope at some level is that someday he could come back and rejoin it or work on it again. He just can't do it right now. That's a lot of people's thoughts is that they wish that this would be fixed. And it's interesting that just took one guy to actually be quite vocal about it for everybody else to say, yeah, I have the same thoughts. And yeah, maybe that also affected me, right? You think that anything will change from this or it's just going to be business as usual until something really big happens? I doubt that there will be any meaningful changes at all. Yeah, that's too bad. I was hoping there would be something, but I think what you're saying is probably pretty true. The good thing is that I feel like most people will just be in their flutter bubble or whatever you want to call it and just keep chugging on, which is good. And I'm happy that this doesn't spoil people to continue working with Flutter and not like back away from it. Yeah, I hope. I mean, because you asked about what changes might happen. I was speaking about internal changes. I, I don't think that Ian leaving is going to shake up Google. And I, I think anybody that believes it might really doesn't comprehend how large that company is. But in terms of outside, Look, you mentioned a lot of people are tweeting about this. A lot of people are delivering positive messages about Flutter. And in fact, at least one of those messages came from Todd Volker. He was my old manager. When I was on the team, I reported directly into him. But he took over for Eric Seidel when Eric left. And even Todd came out and had a post about how he's thankful for Flutter and this and that. And I think the illusion there was that he was almost doing a kind of damage control in response to what everyone's been discussing in light of Ian leaving. And I think the reason that post is there, and I think the reason there are some other similar posts, <clears throat> is because there is a fear that this has a cascading impact on the confidence from the community. So not that it's going to shake up the inside to get better, but that the outside, some people might choose not to invest further in Flutter because it looks like there's now some instability. And of course, everyone's constantly afraid that Google is going to cancel everything. And that's because in the world of consumer products, 
Google has pretty much canceled everything. But it's important to remember that Flutter is not a consumer product. It's a piece of infrastructure. And it is infrastructure that a growing number of Google teams rely on themselves. Doesn't mean it's impossible to get rid of Flutter, but Google would have to do a lot of financial damage to themselves to get rid of Flutter. And then real quick, let me, I, before I, we miss this question, there's one in here. I think this question was about my point about the investigation into my videos. And the question is, did you talk with Tim or Ian about this? And if so, what did they say? Why would the leadership get upset about tutorial videos? I don't remember exactly who I talked to when I first joined the team, but I'm sure I talked to Eric. I'm sure I talked to Todd. I don't remember if I talked to Tim. I may have talked to Ian. Not only were they aware of the videos, those videos were a large reason that they accepted me onto the team. And so, and this is, again goes to corporate politics. It wasn't Flutter leadership that got upset. It was corporate lawyers. I literally, the, I got summoned into a call on a Friday afternoon, and it was me in a, alone in a conference room and two lawyers calling in from some office somewhere. That was the beginning of the investigation. Um, and, I, and I'm not saying that anybody in the Flutter org encouraged me to do anything that was against the rules, but all they knew was that I put out some videos and they were really great videos and hundreds of thousands of people learned from them. They didn't really try to dig further because their job wasn't uh, legal and their job wasn't HR. But when the corporate lawyers eventually discovered this, suddenly I was under investigation. Flutter leadership would have loved those videos to continue from an education standpoint. The lawyers told me, take down your website, take down your channel. We own your videos. You're never allowed to publish them again. I will also point out that I have started an effort to essentially clone Swift UI in Flutter, which means whatever you can paint with Swift UI and whatever gestures you can respond to and whatever UI you can easily put together in Swift UI this project is going to make it possible to do that in a similar way with Flutter. And the reason we're working on that port is because, going back to Tim, when Tim left Flutter and Dart, he went and joined perhaps the only thing that qualifies right now as a direct competitor to Flutter, which is Swift UI. And he's been showing a lot of these direct comparisons of Swift UI versus Flutter using what he perceives to be inadequacies in Flutter as a springboard to promote Swift UI. Now, on the one hand, if there are shortcomings in Flutter, we should fix those. None of us should be happy about shortcomings. On the other hand, I'm not real appreciative of someone who spent six years working on Flutter and Dart to then leave and point out the things that aren't working in Flutter and Dart, because who was in a better position to fix those things than the person who was overseeing all of it? So I, I want to kind of put that social media angle to bed. I want us to prove beyond any doubt that Flutter can paint whatever Swift UI can paint and can make it just as easy. So we're going to port Swift UI over to Flutter. It's going to be a many months project, involve a whole lot of contributors. And then hopefully you'll never have to see tweets again that say, look how great Swift UI is and look how bad Flutter is. So some questions here. Let's see. Will it be based on material blank canvas, something else? Blank Canvas, I've only recently learned about, and I don't know enough about it to say <clears throat> whether it's relevant to us or not. It will not be based on material. In fact, I plan to add a lint rule, which prevents importing material. So literally any file that tries to import material will be flagged by the continuous integration uh, server, and it will be rejected. And that's because I know that I, I want this package to be inviting to iOS developers. And so I know that iOS developers, they are very sensitive to anything that looks like it's from Android. And Material, for better or worse, is highly conflated with Android. So we will not import anything from Material as long as I can possibly make that happen. Instead, we're just going to start from scratch. We're just going to start composing widgets that look like and act like and do what Swift UI views do. And eventually we will cover everything in Swift UI and no one will have to worry about Swift UI doing things that supposedly Flutter can't do. Now there's a question, is Swift UI multi-platform? No, it's not. So maybe when I said direct competitor, you thought 
that I meant that Swift UI is portable. It may be portable in the future. It's not portable now, but competition is much more than just technical details. A lot of air in the room right now is being sucked up by Swift UI. A lot of people are choosing to learn Swift UI instead of Flutter. A lot of people are publishing courses about Swift UI instead of Flutter. A lot of people are promoting Swift UI instead of Flutter. At the end of the day, markets are about people, not technical details. As long as Swift UI is expanding and Flutter is losing out on opportunities, Flutter is in direct competition with Swift UI. Uh, it was also mentioned, so it's great to hear about a Swift UI clone. It would be cool to have material design. Oh, by the way, every Wednesday, we are trying to do a spaces call on X, myself and Ray, to talk about anything in Flutter every week on Wednesdays, typically 12 p.m. Pacific time. Ray might do some later ones. But recently, I, when I was talking about the Swift UI clone, Mike Rydstrom was in the call. He's also known as Material Mike because he does so much material work in the community. And I said, Mike, if we succeed with the Swift UI clone, I want to see you create a material package and get Flutter to remove material from the framework. So if there's another reason for anybody out there to help us succeed with the Swift UI clone, because if we do, we might just be able to convince Mike to do the same thing for material. Sorry, I did kind of miss what happened because uh, I had to deal with something over here, but... I did see you with Swift UI and you're starting to cover that, but I think I caught the tail end of that. What's the story with this? What happened is that there was this growing trend on social media to just kind of, of really focus on specific details about Swift UI and really talk about how amazing it is and really push Swift UI over and over and over with these little 10 line snippets on Twitter. And there was a growing social trend to say, oh, Flutter has to have this syntax capability to keep up with modern Swift UI. What really pushed it over the edge for me was when Tim, after leaving Flutter and Dart, went and joined Apple, went and joined the Swift UI <coughs> effort, and he started posting side by side Swift UI and Flutter code. And the implication of the tweets was look at how simple, straightforward, concise Swift UI is. And look at all this Flutter code that can't even really do the same thing. It was disingenuous at best in a lot of ways, I think. But because Tim was showing actual code, I can't argue with the code samples that he showed. That code was what it was. And so after seeing enough of this behavior and then seeing it capped off with Tim, who used to be the face and voice of Flutter and Dart, using Flutter as a punching bag to help Swift UI, I decided, look, let's just go ahead and create a port of Swift UI in Flutter. Let's go paint the same pixels, run the same animations, get the same scrolling dynamics. Let's make it so you can do the same stuff you can in Swift UI with roughly the same complexity of code. And then no one will be able to go back to Twitter or anywhere else and post side by side code and say, look at how much worse Flutter is. And really, the, like, the reason I say it's disingenuous is because it's not a question of what Flutter is capable of doing. It's only a question of what kind of ready-built tools the Flutter framework chose to give you. So it's not that you can't build the same thing. It's that in the world of Flutter, Flutter is for more than just a typical mobile application. And so Flutter can't just ship you all these cute little APIs that are aimed at typical mobile apps. Flutter has to make sure that you can paint whatever you want, process any touch events you want, process any text input you want. Flutter is an entire foundation for user interfaces. And that means that Flutter didn't have all this time to build cute little spring effects or create all, you know, I mean, we can go down the list of all these typical app-based, card-based, and, and other iOS scaffolding things that Swift UI has built. It's not that you can't build those in Flutter. It's just that Flutter didn't build those for you. But that's not, people aren't understanding that on social media. They look at those two examples, or they look at something in Swift where Tim says, I challenge you to do this in Flutter, the implication being that you can't do it in Flutter. When people are rapidly scrolling through Twitter, 
we all know that's the message they're taking away, right? 99, 999 people out of a thousand aren't stopping to find out if they can do it in Flutter. They're assuming it's a rhetorical question or a rhetorical challenge. They're assuming it can't be done. And personally, I had enough of that. And so I said, look, let's just get the community together. Let's create a package that looks a lot like Swift UI and does the same thing, renders the same pixels. And let's just put this stuff to bed once and for all. That is definitely misleading because if you're relying on a toolkit to act a specific way, then yeah, I mean, of course, a little bit amount of code is going to get you exactly that thing. This, I, I find it a little bit, yeah, like you said, disingenuous. Like you can obviously recreate all that stuff with Flutter because you can paint pixel by pixel, right? So why can't you do that? I mean, it's, and also, yeah, of course, you're usually you're doing with material design, but then you can say the same thing. Look at all this stuff I wrote with Flutter that matches what a Android app would look like, right? Because that's kind of what material does for the most part, if I understand correctly. You've found the difference. Material is a very, I mean, we don't have a great word to describe this stuff. You might call it a particular theme. Obviously, material design is a design system, but what is shipped is not material design. What is shipped are called material components. Material components are one particular manifestation of material design. So the material part in Flutter is really one specific UI theme called material. Well, Swift UI ships one specific theme, which is standard Apple iOS. That they make it look and behave in a certain way. It represents Apple. And if you want a settings screen that looks like an iOS settings screen, Swift UI gives you that scaffold, right? They give you that theme. The only thing Flutter didn't do was build a theme that looks like Apple. Now, of course, there are Cupertino widgets, which were meant to do that. The Flutter team just hasn't been able to keep up. If we're being honest, that's what it is. They just haven't been able to keep up. But I don't think it's a great move to suggest that Flutter is somehow incapable because the Flutter team didn't build an entire suite of Apple-themed user interface widgets. But that is the claim. That's what those social media posts are implying. Yeah, that's too bad. I feel like the way you're saying this kind of sounds like Tim Smith's a little bit doing Flutter dirty by doing this kind of style, but I hope that's not what his intention was. That's the problem now. No one's ever going to know his intention. I think if you look back at Tim's body of presentations, the word political comes to mind. Someone who says the right things, who knows what you know, he knows what people want to hear, and that's what he tends to say. But the problem now is that Tim is paid by Apple. He's cashing their checks. So when Tim says, no, 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 I love Flutter. I care about Flutter. I want Flutter to succeed. That really creates a quandary, doesn't it? Because it's like, wait a second. Is Tim being paid by Apple while still working to help Flutter? I mean, I think most of us would find that to be, well, is some very provocative words come to mind, but they're not good. Like imagine that it had been reversed and Tim was hired from Apple to join and lead Flutter and Dart. And Tim was assuring people that really, you know, really his heart is with Swift UI, even though he's being paid by Google to work on Flutter and Dart. Wouldn't that feel like a, like he's not really upholding his responsibility. And so because there is such a clear conflict of interest at this point, I really don't know what to believe from him anymore. But in terms of actions, he's posting nearly continuously about Swift and Swift UI, promoting them left and right. For Initially, again, he was doing the side-by-side -side with Flutter. That backfired on him pretty quick, I think. And I think he's learned that that's not a great thing for him to do. We're not you know, the community is going to have problems with that. So, you know, I can't speak for his intentions and I can't speak for why he's made the decisions that he's made. I personally was very disappointed that he chose to leave Flutter and Dart in favor of Swift UI. I don't begrudge anyone their career, but I think it's worth 
noting that there are an infinite number of opportunities in tech and he went to the only serious competitor for Flutter and Dart. I personally find that very disappointing. And I think, again, whatever his intentions, the choice to use the work of his former colleagues as a punching bag to promote the company that now pays him, I think that was very poor judgment. Again, just my personal opinion, and who am I? I'm just a guy in a cowboy hat. But in my personal opinion, that was very poor judgment. I mean, there's definitely ways that you could both promote where you're working and still be respectful of previous work. And it, if what you say is true about what you said, I didn't look into it recently, but he probably could have done that a little bit better by saying, hey, if you're building iOS apps, look at what you get by using Swift UI, blah, blah, blah. And here's how you do it in Flutter. You can see if you're going to be building iOS specific apps and you want to take advantage of all the stuff the SDK for iPhone has, you should check this out, right? I think that's a little bit more respectful if, than the way that you took his post. Well, that is more respectful, yes. But even that, like if you were Apple and you were paying him all that money, would you be okay with him making that distinction? <clears throat> because if I was Apple, I'd be saying, listen, Tim, we know you came from Flutter, but enough praising Flutter. You're over here now. We're competing with them. So no, no, you don't get to do half and half. So that's why I'm saying like he has chosen a place to go where there is now an inescapable conflict of interest. And I mean, in a certain light, I can have some sympathy for that position, but he's the one who chose it, right? He could have gone anywhere. He went to the one place in the world where there is a clear, direct and present conflict of interest. And so now, you know, we'll see how that plays out. But I've, I've been disappointed, to say the least. Well, here's a question that may bring you back. The old famous, what's your preferred way to deal with state management? I think you have a very well opinion on that one. Yeah, my opinion is that there's no such thing as state management. It's a made up concept that keeps Flutter developers from becoming better Flutter developers. I've written about this. I have a blog post from, I think, 2018 or 2019 <clears throat> where I wrote about this. I've spoken about this many times. I think, Alan, we, we've probably covered this at least once on each of our previous episodes, right? Am I remembering that correctly? Okay. Well, I mean, I'll, so I'll give a quick summary, but listen to our other videos and see what I say about that. But state management, when you break it down, when you actually look at all of the questions that people phrase as state management and you take them all together, they have nothing in common. There is no consistent through line through all of those questions. Some people want to know, how do I get properties into my widget tree? Some people want to know, how do I get user interaction signals out of my widget tree? Some people want to know, how do I make network calls? Some people want to know, how do I talk to databases? Some people want to know, how do I cache data? How do I support offline mode? When you start breaking it down, nearly every state management question is actually a completely different question couched in the term state management. And if you take all of them together, what you're really asking is, how do I engineer software? And the answer is, live an entire career and maybe you'll figure it out like the rest of us, because that's what it takes. Every day we're learning how to do that. So I would suggest unless you have a very specific reason to do so, stay away from all the so-called state management libraries. They're not making your code simpler. They're making it more complex. Focus on the root of every problem. Keep pulling on the string until your question looks like a very specific question, and then you can post it to Stack Overflow or Quora or Twitter, and you'll get an answer because now it's specific. And then keep doing that. Do that every day. And in about six months, you're going to realize that you never even think about this thing called state management anymore because you'll realize that none of your problems were ever this made up thing called state management. So that's my perspective on state management. I don't mean to kick a dead horse, but I just saw this very interesting comment that came up. The train of thought thought that Tim went to Apple to do something for Flutter. I thought that's kind of interesting that he thought that because that would never cross my mind to me. It's, uh, I don't know, he got a better job opportunity or whatever. Any thoughts on that? Unless there's information that I'm unaware of, that never occurred to me. It was <clears throat> seemed pretty obvious that he went over there to work for Apple doing Apple things. 
And at first, I wasn't sure what part of Apple he was going to really be focused on, but it didn't take long before my Twitter feed started showing his posts about Swift UI. And it didn't take long before those posts included comparisons with Flutter. And I will also recognize, because I don't like, we don't need to pretend that everybody agrees with me. Some people don't. So one commenter said they felt that I'm taking, I think this is about Tim, taking things very negatively. And yep. So look, I'll say fair enough. Like I said earlier, I'm just a guy in a cowboy hat. I'm not omniscient. But given my total interactions with all things Flutter over the last five years, I do not look at that move in a positive light. Tim has the right to go work wherever he wants and do whatever he wants. That it is literally his career, but it doesn't mean I have to like it. And in this particular case, like Ian, I got no problem with where he's going and what he's doing. Eric got no problem with where he's going and what he's doing. And there have been many other people to come and go through the Flutter org who have gone on to just do totally unrelated stuff. I don't have any opinion about them either. I have an opinion here because the person who had arguably the most visibility over all of Flutter and Dart, one, that person is ultimately responsible for where Flutter and Dart end up. And that person went across the street to the competitor and used his colleague's work as a springboard to make the competition look better. I simply don't respect that move. And maybe that's unfair of me. Maybe that's too critical. And by the way, if Tim would ever like to come on and make counterpoints, I have no problem with that either. But right now with what I've seen, with what I've been shown, I'm really not a fan of the choices that he made. I think you and Tim have always had some differing opinions. I do remember there was some talk about, you know, what if Flutter is good for web, right? Obviously, his opinion is not yet for those kinds of things. And you said opposite. So I feel like there's always been some disagreement or, or at least not seeing eye to eye on every issue involving Flutter. So that would also be yeah. interesting to see. Well, I will say that back then, I mean, that was purely substantive. I will admit that my commentary tonight is about Tim's career choices for Tim. So that admittedly, that's a bit more personal. But yeah, the disagreement before is that, well, and you say that Tim thought that Flutter wasn't right for websites. Here again, I don't really know what Tim believes. What Tim promoted publicly as the official face of Flutter was that Flutter supposedly was for web apps and not websites, wherever you can draw that line. But he did that because Flutter was taking so much flack for the fact that it was a big bundle to download for a website, took a long time to start up. It was just very unwieldy for websites. And rather than kind of like push through that moment, instead, the Flutter team adjusted their strategy to simply decide oh, no, 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 it's not meant for that. So like, rather than make it work for that, or rather than just say, we want it to work for that in the future, but it's not ready yet, there was a strategic move with the whole organization to say, oh, no, 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 Flutter isn't made for that. You're not supposed to do that. And I see Ray is in the chat here saying hi to us. Ray knows exactly what I'm talking about because he's tried to promote Flutter for web and he's found a lot of pushback. But back to the point about Tim, again, remember, Tim had a professional messaging responsibility. He was the face and voice of Flutter. So I don't actually know what he really believed or didn't believe about Flutter and web. I only know what he said, and what he said was as the spokesperson for the entire organization. Does that make sense? Definitely makes sense to me. I just wonder if people at home will understand that. There was another question here I thought was pretty good. I'm just trying to see if I can find it. Here we go. This is the one saying that you do a lot of stuff. What's a typical day in super declarative life? Uh, well, I mean, it's pretty much just me at my desk every day. I know it's popular to go to a lot of Flutter conferences. I really never go. I, I suppose if there were some, I might do it. Like there are some in the U.S. or especially some on the West Coast, I might do it. But as long as they're all happening in Europe, I'm not flying around the world for that personally. There's one meetup around here that happens every few months that I try to go to. Other than that, there's really no other events. So it's mostly just me at my desk every day, whether I'm working on a proprietary client's features or I'm working on our open source packages or I'm recording videos or every Thanksgiving talking to you 
through this camera. That's about it. It's a pretty solitary life, but I get to work on a lot of a variety of things that are interesting. And so I appreciate that part. What upcoming features in Flutter and Dart are you most excited about? Well, let's start with Dart because there's probably less there. I have been a big proponent of Dart's simplicity. And even though I recognize that there are some things that could be made easier with new language features, I am very bearish on that. I'm less concerned about getting like 5% more effectiveness out of the language. And I'm much more worried about joining projects where people have utterly abused the language features and they've created these horribly complex code bases because they could. This was something we also talked about on our recent space on X. And I mentioned Ray in the chat, Ray is my co-host, we host those together. And we were talking about this there as well, which is, it is my belief that developers have a tendency to find a way to make use of any language feature. Anything a, a programming language can do, developers will do, and a lot of those things aren't healthy. They will find ways to mangle language features together to do things that never even occurred to you, things that don't need to happen, and it just makes things so impossibly complicated for no reason. That's what worries me about new features. The next really big feature that I've heard about coming to Dart is metaprogramming. And that's essentially code that runs during the compilation process <clears throat> to simplify it. If you think anything about Dart is complicated today, wait until you see metaprogramming. The number of ways that metaprogramming can be abused to make it impossible to do your job, it's infinite because you're putting a programming language on a programming language at that point. So good luck reading developer's code and knowing what on earth it's doing. Every, so much stuff is going to move into magic. As for Flutter, I'm not even sure what's on the roadmap at this point. Most of my interactions with Flutter these days are things like I'm working on Super Editor. We're trying to implement some standard editor feature, and we find out that Flutter hasn't exposed the part of the operating system input method editor that you need to do that or their API only exposes half of it or there's some limitation there and then we have to go over and file a bug against Flutter and hope that someday they make it available. I tend to be focused on the progress of those tickets. I don't know what the general purpose Flutter features look like and I guess Alan that's an equal question for you which is do you know what the current roadmap looks like? Do you know what the next big features for Flutter are supposed to be? I actually have no idea. I haven't seen the most recent stuff for Flutter. We're not doing a lot of Flutter projects at the moment. What I do like, and I'm hoping to see more, is more functional things within Flutter in terms of immutability and, and, and uh, pattern matching, having a lot more of this kind of stuff. It's already huge to, when that stuff came out to begin with, but I think there's more that could be done. And I see that you're against it, and I understand where you're coming from, but as somebody who works a lot with Rust and Elixir that are very highly functional with pattern matching and so forth, I'm super welcoming of those features, and I, and I wish there was more because I enjoy using those in other languages. But then again, I feel like now Dart's become a different language than what it was before. So take it or leave it how, if you like it or don't like it, I can understand not liking it because now it's changed. But some of those features I definitely do enjoy, and I find that I've been promoting these other functional languages because of those features. And when I talk to people who do use Dart or, of course, Flutter, and they use it and they like those new features, I say, actually, this stuff has been out for a while. Now you see why I like this other language because of these features. And now you can enjoy those and you understand where I'm coming from. I hear you on that. I'm just rarely compelled by developer enjoyment. That just strikes me as a terrible metric. Is it enjoyable because things are being accomplished that couldn't be accomplished before? Or is it just some kind of personal gravitation towards some series of glyphs that now are in an order that you prefer instead of the other way? And I find, especially with functional stuff, the, the functional versus non-functional stuff is so tribal. There are so many people who just want functional everything because they love functional stuff, period. That's, that's the extent of the discussion. Now, that's not everyone and that's not all the time. And I understand there are some use cases 
probably not so much in app development, but there are some use cases in the world of programming where functional composition seems to be the most natural way of forming the solution. I don't think that tends to be the case in app development for various reasons. When I look at what these the pro-functional people in the dark community are saying, even when I try to engage with them and say, like, what are you trying to solve? What isn't working right now? I don't see any meaningful answers. What they tend to say is they explain why it's possible. And I'm like, well, okay, should we go back to Jurassic Park? I mean, should we go back to the classic line? You were so busy asking if you could, you didn't stop to ask if you should. What I want to see are reasons for features that are based in solving something that is either literally unsolvable today or you've made a solution literally 10 to 100x simpler, objectively simpler, by reframing the programming paradigm. But if it's just, hey, I like functional, like the guy in that meme that says, I like turtles. If it's just, I like functional, if that's the extent of it, you might still get your way with the Dart language, but I'm not going to be in your camp on that one, I'm afraid. Okay, fair enough. Well, I have some practical cases for this one. Something I think, I'm pretty sure Dart doesn't have this yet, but for instance, I was doing a huge refactor the other day, and the amount of if-else statements was simply ludicrous in terms of trying to understand what's going on in this code. I basically reduced the code, because you think, for this language, right, you have if, and then you have a do, and then you have, you know, whatever's for the if, and then you have an end, right? So for every if statement, there's not one line, there's actually two, technically three, if you just count one line of things you have to do. I think Dart's still the same, right? You have still like brackets, right? Usually you put a ending bracket on the line after you're done. If you could pattern match this stuff at the function head and say, well, if this is null, return this, right? And then if this one is an empty list, then return this one. And then finally, when you get down to the complicated case, then you can do all the special logic. Like, Immediately, when somebody looks at this code, they can go from top to bottom and say, okay, this one, if this kid, this one, this one, like it, it automatically matches up. And it's so quick to understand in comparison to the if else spaghetti mess I had to deal with. I think for this one, yeah, both it's a preference, but take away the preference, there's still a huge amount of understanding you can get just by saying, okay, if this one is null, this is going to get returned. Like it's just one line, you can do one line declarations in there. Or even if, if for two lines or three lines, it's fine. But if else, I mean, and then the else goes on for, for forever. This is a huge benefit for understanding the code and just for brevity. And if you can decrease the lines of code, increase the understanding and time to understand, that's a huge win for me. And I promote this kind of thing. But I don't think we have this in Dart where you can pattern match at the function head, which I think would be so much of a benefit because that's what I use every day. And I, and I think it's uh, huge for understanding at least. So I hear you on that. Your premise is, I have some code, it is verbose, it is complicated, and it would be much simpler and more concise if we had language feature X. First, it's always difficult to dig into that when you and I aren't literally sitting in front of a specific snippet of code and looking at what that means. But if you want to make a robust argument, there are still two major pieces that you haven't looked at. The first piece is, is there any other way to represent this same behavior without using if statements, but using the existing language capabilities? Now, that's a question that very few people seriously try to answer. They look at their code, they think that's the only way it can be, and then they say, well, if I had this feature, it would be simpler. But when you look at something like, let's say, a bunch of if statements, it begs the question, why not consider using enums which have methods implemented on them and delegate to those enums instead of using a bunch of if statements? Or why not define some classes and delegate to those instead of using if statements? There is almost always, even in Dart, alternatives to using if statements that might make them a lot simpler. But I can't show you what that looks like until we're in a specific piece of code and we look at refactoring that code. But that's only one area. The second area is, if we're going to talk about adding new features, are there any other language features which would similarly make your code simpler and more concise 
other than the one that you want. Because maybe there's a different language feature that gets you the same result, the same simplicity, but is a less confusing feature. I think both of those questions have to be asked thoroughly before you arrive at the position that, no, there's nothing else that can solve this problem today. And of all possible future options, the one that I want is the best one. You have to at least answer both of those questions. And, uh, and I, I don't see many people going through that kind of rigorous effort. Maybe you have, but I think most people, they really just want what they want. They want their thing for themselves and they haven't gone through a rigorous analysis. That's a good point. In fact, I'm almost thinking another idea we could have in the future would be, let's take some of this code that I think is good and that I like, and then let's try to convert this into Dart that you would consider uh, uses the best features of Dart to you know represent that, right? Because what I like and what I want to write, I wish was in Dart, but it's not. Can I do it another way? Sure. But I think that other way that I know about, maybe there's a better way. That's why I would be interested to see how you would convert this into Dart. We can look at options for converting, but just to be clear, I don't look at language features, like, like existing language features in Dart. I don't look at them with a moral lens. There's no good or bad language feature. And so if we're going to convert some code, there wouldn't be any version that's like the right way or the good way. We could just say like, here's four different ways you could do that in Dart. Do any of these look appealing to you? Uh, and, and for what reasons? Because by the way, appealing, it shouldn't be based on like some poetic vision of the code. You have to bring the business problem with you. One very important aspect to the way that you write code is a sense for the places where the code is likely to change a lot and places where it's likely to change a little. And that depends a lot on the company, the team, the customer, the business domain. You need to have that context at all times. You don't want to do this in isolation. But given that context, sure, we could say, okay, here's four different ways you could do it. Which of these look the best given your particular team and company and why? And then, and then we'd have some more information to work off of. That's fair enough. I already see some people who are interested to see. There's this comment from Crimson who, who agrees with what you say about trying to push too much functional stuff into Dart. It's not going to be useful. He also says he'd be fun to watch what I, what I think would be interesting. There's this one from Block. Have you ever used Dart as a backend language? I think you probably have, no? Yeah, I've used it very minimally. So at the moment, I'm trying to remember if this is still true completely. I, th I think at the moment, all of my websites are literally rendered with Flutter. So superdeclarative.com, flutterbountyhunters.com, blog.flutterbountyhunters.com. I think those are all Flutter apps as websites. I haven't recompiled those in a long time. So unfortunately, they're using out of date Flutter for web. They could be smaller and faster than they are. I just haven't taken the time to rebuild them. But not only are they Flutter websites, they are served from a Dart web server. For each of those websites, I'm running a GCP Docker image, which is just a Dart image. I add the shelf library. And then I process each incoming HTTP request for one of the pages on the website. And uh, one of the reasons that I created that little custom Dart web server is because, as Flutter developers know, you deploy a singular app. But in the web browser, you need to be able to go to a specific URL. So on the web server, I need to pull out that URL, the path, and I need to make sure to send the right metadata back, the, the headers in the HTML, like the website title, description, et cetera. I need that to match the specific page that you asked for, even though what I'm serving you is a singular Flutter app. That's kind of a little maneuver you need to do if you want to serve an app as a website. And to do that, again, I wrote a, a little Dart web server using the shelf library. And on a related note, I'm currently in the process of building a time tracking app for the Flutter Bounty Hunters so we can track our time and do billing. Obviously, the app is going to be built with Flutter. It's going to be built for desktop, but it's going to need to talk to a web server, and I will probably do that in Dart as well. I might use Shelf, or I might use Dart Frog, or I might use ServerPod. I haven't really decided which way I'm going to go yet, 
but probably I'll use one of those to create a Dart implementation for the server side for that too. So Ray is saying Flutter Web now loads in one to 1.5 seconds. Have you seen this? Yeah, Ray's been on top of this. Ray's been watching a lot of the web improvements. And so there have been improvements for sure. And I'm just pointing out, if you go to my websites, you're not going to get those improvements yet because I haven't recompiled in many, many months for any of those websites. I'm guessing you probably don't know this, but he's asking, does Dart team have any plans to work on any backend ecosystem tools plugins? I have no information about that, but I doubt it. I think Dart just needs to make sure we have the best language possible. Flutter is a UI toolkit. There isn't even really a natural team to do that because Dart is a language team. It's not an application team. It's not a framework team. So I don't even know who would do that inside of Google at this point. Yeah, not to mention, I think they already worked on giving us the tools, right? We got Shelf. And then from there, you I don't know if I can say you're expected to just use Shelf and build upon it, but Shelf is kind of pretty agnostic to a certain extent. It does very minimal amount. Even Shelf, you don't have to use. It's not like Shelf does something magic. The question also becomes, well, if you want a backend, what's wrong with Dart Frog? What's wrong with ServerPod? You know, of the options that are out there. And I, I want to say Invertase may have said they were going to introduce their own kind of backend system, but I'd want to know where are those falling short? What aren't they doing? And also, whatever the answer to that is, maybe if you tell them, they'll implement it. I wouldn't look to the Dart team or to Google to mess around in that space. I'm not sure it's needed. Somebody still wants to do our live coding session if you're up for it someday. Yeah, we can try to do that someday. The way that those go is that some people say they're really excited to watch it. And then you start the live stream. And then people remember that watching somebody else code is kind of like watching paint dry. And pretty soon nobody's watching. That's like, uh, that's what happened with The Boring Show. I mean, The Boring Show, the name, I guess, was kind of a uh, tongue in cheek, but it also really was boring and not many people stuck around for much of that. I do know that there's some people who do love that kind of stuff because it's interesting to see like what's the thought process, especially for some people that you look up to, like how do they actually break down a problem? How do they solve it? What language do they use, et cetera? Here's another interesting question kind of coming back to previous topic is, do you think Hixie, Eric, you and others will ever come back to the Flutter team? Any chance of outside people or outside Google can influence the decision of structure? I think the latter is probably a big no. Well, let me start with the first question. I obviously can't answer for Eric or Ian. I don't have any personal relationship with them. Given that Eric started a company, though, unless that company fails, I'm not sure how that would happen. Ian, it, it seems more open-ended because I'm not sure he's announced a, any professional thing he's doing next. But again, I don't have any information that the rest of the community doesn't have. As for me, I would be open to it under certain like circumstances or conditions. But to be honest with you, I don't think they want me back. Look at how I talk about stuff. Does this sound like a typical part of the Flutter culture to anybody? I think they'd rather just keep the kind of culture they've got than to have someone like me drop in and kind of mix things up. Uh, but I guess what was the second part of the question? Anybody from outside Google can influence the decision to restructure the team's reporting uh, structure. I think basically no. I don't see anybody from outside, you know, doing something. Obviously, I think you're going to think the same, right? For the reporting structure in Google, of course not. Outside of Google has no control over inside of Google. However, something that I brought up on our last Spaces call was the idea of a Flutter foundation. And the idea would be to get a bunch of companies and prolific developers together in a kind of, in an, uh, I mean, I know we use the term community a lot, but a community isn't just a group of people, it's, it's collaboration. And so you, we could create this organization with many companies, many developers, and perhaps with all of those people coming together, and if that group has the technical capacity to actually maintain Flutter independently if needed, that might be enough leverage to push the Flutter organization to alter some of its behaviors. I guess the, the kind of nuclear option that I pointed out in the previous discussion was the technical capability or the technical opportunity to fork Flutter away from Google. Now, I don't want to do that. I don't think we should do that. That's kind of like a nuclear option when everything is going terribly. But if you can imagine a group 
which is at least capable of doing that. When I say capable, I mean like think about Impeller. How many people on the planet are capable of continuing work on Impeller? Not very many. So if there were this community organization that definitely had top to bottom expertise capable of working on any part of Flutter, and they had all the corporate or many corporate interests involved to represent what the community needs, that might offer enough leverage to actually incentivize the Flutter organization to change course in important areas. That has nothing to do with reporting structure, but it does have to do perhaps with, with the roadmap or with priorities, that kind of thing. Because right now, we're all just little independent forces and none of us stack up against the size and scope of Google. There's a complete asymmetry in leverage and capability and authority. And typically, as long as that asymmetry exists, we're going to go wherever Google takes us. And that's not up to us at all. So I'd like to see some attempt to even the playing field so that Google is not the, the one singular authority over what Flutter becomes. There is some places that do have foundations. I think Python has some kind of foundation for sure. Rust has one. But the foundations themselves can also have their own issues. Uh, I don't want to go of through course. kind of... Yeah, spilling stuff yeah, of course, out, but there's no, the Rust Foundation there's no, has a lot of criticism. Yeah, there's no silver bullet, and that's we always have to stay away from that idea. There's there's no easy fix to any complicated problem. I'm just pointing out that right now there is literally a singular authority in all of Flutter. Like I get it, Flutter's open source. I get it that any of us could fork Flutter. Go try it. Go try and fork Flutter and see how quickly you give up. In practice, it is not really feasible for just about any company at this point. I think maybe there are some massive companies in China that have forked Flutter over the years, but also who knows if they, maybe they regret doing that. Maybe they've wasted so much time maintaining their fork that they wish they didn't do it. So I just think it's worth recognizing that there's a huge asymmetry right now. And I would at least like to see some kind of structure in the community that Google has to somewhat negotiate with before they change the direction of Flutter. What if tomorrow Flutter's mission changed? What if tomorrow Flutter said, we've discovered that 76% or 86% of all of our users work in the enterprise. We believe that Flutter is the best way to build enterprise apps. And now Flutter is nothing but an enterprise application framework. That could happen tomorrow, and what would any of us do about it? What could we do about it? We have no leverage. That concerns me. And uh, at this point, the three highest level people to ever work in the Flutter organization no longer work at Google. There's perhaps never been a better opportunity to bring that skill set together than right now. And maybe we should. But I don't know if other people are interested in it. I don't know what that would take. That's just an idea that's been on my mind. There is something recent in the news that I saw, and I just pulled it up to make sure I kind of read on this one. Huawei is a pretty large company. Of course, they've been crippled with everything happening recently. But you know that they had to fork their own OS based off of Android. What I keep seeing in the title, and I don't know the technical specifics, but that they said they completely like separate from Android to where they don't even allow you to run Android apps anymore, which was kind of the fail-safe backwards compatibility that they had for a while in order to kind of keep going. So now they finally cut ability to actually run Android apps now. And, you know, this is just what the news says. Maybe it's wrong, but, and I don't disagree with it, but they're having problems trying to get people to make apps for their OS, which is very difficult to do, right? I mean, that's pretty, I mean, this is kind of a, like you said, this is kind of an example similar but not the same to where you have to fork something off if you change it in such a way that they're solely totally like incompatible you may have issues even if you're a large company such as huawei which is one of the largest in china if not the largest and they can't even make it happen even with the way their their whole economy works where they really promote china for companies first yep and that's why i call it the nuclear option it's the option that nobody ever wants but also, you know, keep in mind, you know, not to get too much in, into war-based metaphors, but what is the real purpose of a nuclear weapon in the world today? The point of a nuclear weapon is to make sure you never have to use a nuclear weapon. 
it's a deterrent. And so if the community had the capacity to fork and maintain Flutter, we might find that Flutter cares a whole lot more about what the community has to say. We've been chatting for almost two hours. Maybe we should start to close this up with some finishing thoughts. Yeah, I guess let me just plug a few things. I mentioned it earlier, but I'll mention again. Ray and I host a weekly X or Twitter spaces call about any Flutter stuff. We welcome anybody to come and actually ask questions or comment. Like we want to bring people up on stage and hear what other people are up to. It's an opportunity for the so-called community to actually do communal things. Also, for any of you out there that use Flutter in your company, you might consider checking out the Flutter Bounty Hunters, where we could build some of the more boring infrastructure tools that you need, possibly help you split funding with other companies and share it with the rest of the community so that nobody has to solve those problems again in the future. And also, if you'd like my help on a proprietary basis, like a direct contract kind of relationship, you can go to superdeclarative.com and that's where you can hire me independently. And I think that's all on my end. How about you, Alan? Same over here. I also have a consulting company, which is actually funding this podcast. I don't plug it enough as I probably should. Go ahead and go to, to www.plangora.com, P-L-A-N-G-O-R-A.com. And uh, if you're interested in what we do, go ahead and reach out to us and see if we can work together. Same as you, Matt. So even though we're in the same area, we kind of compete. I, I don't think there's any competition between the two of us. We have different ideas and different ways of doing stuff. But um, it is always a pleasure to chat with you and to hear what you have to say. You, you're a man of strong opinions, but you don't just come with an opinion. You come with an opinion and some facts to it and uh, interesting thoughts. I never thought so much about Tim Smith uh, leaving and uh, you, you definitely brought to my eyes another perspective. Yep, I guess that's what I'm here for. So I'm, I appreciate you having me on. And I also, I, I appreciate that we had a lot of audience interaction today or tonight, depending on your time zone. I hope that everyone in the audience joins us again for the next one of these. It might be a year from now. It might be less than a year from now. I guess it depends whenever we get around to doing it again. Well, thanks again for coming on. And uh, you got to get back to eating up the turkey before it spoils. That's right. Got to keep stuffing myself. All right, see you.